in the talk. Um, uh, we are going to uh, discuss a bit web browsing through XR. Uh, my name is uh, Juan Sanchez, and I am one of the co-founders of Igalia. Uh, we have been doing open source for, for 20 years now. Uh, we contribute to many projects in graphics, multimedia, uh, but also many contributions to web browsers, web engines. Uh, so one of the things we are working on now is, is Wolvik, this open source project for uh, WebXR uh, and XR devices. And I am doing, uh, among many things, at the Gala do product and project management for, for Wolvik. Uh, so the presentation will have two, two parts. The first one will be a more general discussion about what it implies to mm, bring uh, the web experience into XR devices, both from the part the, for the side of taking the traditional web experiences and, and, and using uh, analogous uh, user cases in XR, and from the point of view of immersive, the immersive web. Uh, and then in the second part, we will talk a bit more specifically about Wolvik as a project and what we are doing there. Uh, so let's start with the, with the traditional web. As you all know, the, the expectation of a user that comes from uh, PCs and portable devices is quite high, right? Nowadays, browsers are big applications that implement many things. So the first thing uh, in the XR space is, it, is to emulate all that, like all the basic uh, support for Windows, tabs, bookmarks, uh, uh, extensions like uh, ad blockers, uh, private mode, anything you can think about. Of course, uh, video, video playback with DRM. Um, and all that requires uh, quite a big effort. And, and some web APIs are even, uh, you need to specifically implement them for, for XR, right? So I'll be showing also some, some videos of how this look, looks like in the case of Wolvik. Uh, so for example, here you can see uh, the 2D UI of the, of the browser. It runs on a 360 environment that we control as well. Uh, I'll talk about uh, that more later. Uh, and you can see like the, the basic uh, menus and, and, and icons. And you get more or less the functionality that you, you have on a, on a regular browser. Uh, you can do things like uploading files, or you can even install applications as, as web apps, uh, because we have support for that. And you can even run them locally if, if the web app supports that. And many other things. Uh, second thing, thinking about traditional web, is how to adapt uh, input methods. Uh, of course, as you know, on XR devices, you have mostly controllers or hand gestures. Now, with new things coming, like eye tracking. And then it's very important, especially for, like, in, uh, writing text is not very comfortable, so a very good voice input is important. But at the same time, most of the traditional web has been optimized for years for desktops and touch screens. In many cases, websites even assume that the device that is connecting is one of those. Uh, so uh, in some cases, they use specific input methods that are not easy to translate into XR, uh, things like pinching and dragging or, or even keyboard shortcuts. So in the case of Wolvik, we all the time try to um, kind of emulate that we are touch screens or desktops, depending even on the website. Uh, we decide what is, what is better in each case to try to provide the best experience for, for the users. Um, so here you see an example of uh, input methods, uh, just basic interaction with the browser with hand tracking. And you can click, you can scroll. Uh, we support also basic gestures uh, from the platform. Uh, so it's uh, Quite a good experience, I think. Uh, another important use case for the traditional web is, is basically consuming text and images, like reading content. Uh, we see from our users that this is also something that they, they often do with an XR browser. Uh, there are some limitations that depend even on the resolution of the headset, right? The, the, that can ha impose some limitations. Uh, so in Wolvik, we try to give flexibility uh, to define the large windows, to optimize the size and quality of the text. Uh, one needs to be careful because a big, too big a screen is also provides a bad experience. Even can be a bit painful to move the head too much. Uh, but in general, I think we can achieve a good experience for users. And some of the hardware limitations are kind of progressively being removed by, by just better hardware with the new headsets. Uh, so here you can see, for example, uh, Wolvik showing the Wikipedia, and you you can decide that the window needs to be a bit bigger, still in, in your field of vision. Uh, and well, you can also uh, change the text size if needed. Um, 
Yeah, continuing with the examples of things that coming from the traditional web uh, are interesting for XR, we think a very important use case is just uh, getting things done, right? Uh, productivity. Uh, the large vis visual space provides a lot of opportunities for like doing multiple things at the same time, using spatial syncing and memory to, to learn, the, to, to understand where you, where you store information. Um, and uh, well, we are actually working on richer ways of presenting this information to the user. I'll comment a bit more about this uh, a bit later. Uh, in general, we think that uh, browsing in XR is a very, has a very good uh, opportunity for helping us to be productive. Right? Uh, this is another example of what we're showing uh, three screens at the same time, kind of around you. Uh, you. You have an active screen, but you can have complementary information on the other ones. You can run a multimedia and at the same time read, it, read about, that, about it. And, and it's quite, quite a good experience. Always keep in mind that seeing this in videos is obviously a kind of a different uh, feeling, but uh, with the headset, it, it feels really, really well, right? Um, yeah, and finally, as a, as a last comment about the traditional web, uh, obviously video consumption is, is a very imp important use case. An XR browser needs to also support this very well. Uh, it's actually one of the use cases that we see our users are uh, making more uh, suggestions or requests about. Uh, we provide the 2D and 3D stereoscopic video, stereoscopic video support, and well, even uh, DRM support for like the traditional, the, the well-known platforms like Disney Plus or HBO Max. Sometimes it's a bit challenging because some of those platforms on mobile, and they assume an XR device is mobile, they they kind of force you into the app. So we have to always like see if we need to pretend to be a desktop and then implement uh, DRM as if we were a desktop, basically. Um, yeah, here you can see uh, kind of full screen, uh, Wolvik uh, showing a, a movie in Disney Plus. Um, and uh, there are also possibilities to support, as I said, the 3D. In this case, it's a side by side video, and uh, the browser merges the two images to provide the right uh, 3D emulation. Um, and then, yeah, this was more about like traditional use cases, but of course with the XR de devices we have new opportunities and also new challenges, uh, and this is what I will discuss now. The first one is the uh, new kinds of videos, right? Obviously, the immersive video support. Uh, we are seeing that this is a space that is growing very fast. Um, many are distributed just using YouTube. Uh, in theory, all those videos have the right metadata, but we have even uh, implemented a lot of heuristics in the browser, so kind of we try to guess uh, which kind of video we are going to show and then automatically present it for the user. If it is monoscopic or stereoscopic or 100 or 360 degrees, um, if it doesn't work, which does, I think most of the time, uh, the user can al also select manually uh, the kind of uh, format, right? So. Uh, again, we are seeing that uh, this is uh, quite an important use case. There's a lot of uh, touristic content uh, about uh, many places, and the experience of uh, watching this in the video is, is quite smooth. You, a modern browser support easily uh, 4K, 8K, 8K images, and, and this works quite well in modern uh, XR headsets. This is also a trailer for, for a popular game. The, the second thing related to the uh, immersive web is WebXR, obviously. So this is uh, the set of APIs that the W3C is curating and, and improving to support all kinds of things in, inside the web for XR devices. Um, in, in a web browser, this is implemented by the, what, what is called the web engine. Uh, but uh, even, even with that, you still have to do a lot of integration work on the browser side to make sure that you support the graphical layers, to, to provide the input methods that interact with the website. So it's uh, quite a, a lot of work, but also a huge opportunity in this space. Uh, here you can see running uh, uh, on Wolvik, uh, one example of a 360 uh, WebXR application where you can simulate a spray uh, painting on a wall, which also supports AR, by the way, this application. Uh, or this is another one where you can uh, paint uh, quite realistically uh, um, in, on a canvas, uh, and it's uh, quite nice. You can play some music while you do it, and all this is, again, web technology, JavaScript, 
CSS and HTML with some frameworks uh, helping. Uh, a, a big space that, for example, is important for some of our partners in, in Wolvik is education, and this connects with what I just mentioned about the video um, and interactive content through WebXR. Uh, we really think that XR is the best way to experience immersive information, and uh, also distribution is uh, much easier and much faster, right? You, you don't need to create a native app, distribute it through the app store. Sometimes app stores have quite strict policies about publishing, etc. And some of this content can even be distributed through YouTube or any of these very standard and popular channels, right? Um, so there are plenty of examples of this. Again, this is a 360 video running on, on, on Wolvik, and it's uh, two pilots explaining how to fly a plane. Uh, this is a, an interactive experience to train uh, the crew of, uh, of a plane in different situations and how to react to different emergency situations the proper way. Uh, there are also uh, interactive experiences built on WebXR uh, to explore virtual museums, and uh, you can move around uh, using the, the controllers, and you can get information about the, the, the paintings in this case. This is another nice experience where you can land on, on, on Mars, and you can interact with the device there, get the interactive information about uh, a specific mission. Uh, and yeah, all this, again, is WebXR or video, or both combined, right? Um, then gaming, of course. Uh, gaming is uh, one of the most popular use cases for now, together maybe with video, uh, for, for the users of a browser. Uh, traditionally, there were two challenges related to delivering large assets that are needed for the, bra for the game at the beginning, right? The downloading all, all that in a reasonable amount of time. And then the performance, uh, to achieve a performance that can be compared to native. And I think the evolution of the uh, web engines during the last five to 10 years has been amazing. And the performance nowadays is, is very good. So there are examples of games that are quite complex and are fully done with a WebXR and, and have a very good performance. There's kind of a community of, of indie developers uh, working on games. An example of this is Wonderland Engine or HiVR, Hi which are projects that we work quite a lot with uh, in Wolvik. For example, this is a game that uh, is a WebXR implementation of a popular native game, right? And, and it's very complete. It has uh, a lot of uh, different uh, features and possibilities. It runs very smoothly on, on modern XR devices. There are many other games, right? This is just a, 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 to learn climbing. It's quite, quite nice when you have the headset on, a bit more difficult to perceive here. Um, so yeah, we, we can see that there is the combination of the, the traditional web with modern uh, options, immersive options, is a very powerful set of uh, use cases with uh, obviously a lot of uh, challenges or work needed on the browser side. Uh, so. This is the kind of motivation for us. It was the motivation for us to create, uh, to, to, to develop the, the Wolvik project. Uh, Wolvik started uh, a bit of history now. Uh, Wolvik started uh, as uh, Firefox Reality. Uh, many of you might, might remember this project by Mozilla in September uh, 2018. Uh, so five years ago, basically, and it was uh, a quite good project for the uh, devices of that generation. It was had initial support for the WebXR APIs at that time. Uh, things changed quite a lot in five years. Uh, but then, for uh, a number of reasons, Mozilla uh, didn't continue with the project, and for almost uh, two years, it was kind of stopped, and uh, nobody was developing it. Uh, so we are good partners with Mozilla. We have been working with them in, on Firefox for a long time, and uh, we decided to take over the project uh, early last year, so more or less a year and a half ago. Uh, and we uh, relaunched it with, with a new name as, as Wolvik. Right? That's how the project started. In terms of architecture, to explain a bit more what, what Wolvik uh, actually is, we could say we have six different pieces that work together. There's a custom 3D library that runs the, the 360 environment and allows us to, to have a lot of flexibility with the UI. 
Uh, and then in this environment, we paint uh, mostly for now Android UI components. So we, our UI is Android based uh, for now. It could be different in the future. And then und uh, underlying this, there's a web engine, uh, with, which does a lot of work, obviously. And originally it was Gecko. Uh, now we are working also on Chromium. Uh, we reuse a lot of building blocks from Mozilla for building the browser to avoid reinventing the wheel. So things like uh, book or bookmarks management or uh, things like how to decide which search engine you are going to use, they are uh, implemented by using some of these components. Uh, then we, we talk uh, with the OpenXR driver in the device. Um, originally, the project was using also some na native uh, drivers uh, supporting them, but nowadays the majority of the devices uh, support the OpenXR. And then we also use some platform-specific uh, libraries for things like analytics or specific services that the, the hardware vendors provide that we try to also offer to the Wolvic users. So all that together is what we call the Wolvic project. Uh, talking a little bit more about web engines, uh, the web engine is, is key in, in, in a browser, obviously. Uh, it's a component that takes the CSS, uh, HTML, JavaScript, and, and renders everything and, and allows you to interact with the website or with the WebXR experience. Uh, and as I said, originally we were using Gecko. Actually, the specific version is Gecko for Android, uh, the, the, the package that Mozilla uh, maintains. And it works quite well. It's what is running in the current versions. But we have been working for six months on uh, Chromium backend as well uh, for a number of reasons. One of them, the performance is, is very good if you use Chromium. Uh, and also the AR support and the support for kind of the latest WebXR APIs. Right? So we have, a, we have a booth here. And in the booth, we are showing uh, the first demo, the first public demo of uh, the Chromium backend running. And we will release officially during November as well. Uh, we will maintain both versions. So it's not that the Gecko version is going to disappear, because there are also some nice things of using uh, this uh, Mozilla technology. Uh, but we will do both at the same time during next year. And then another feature that is very important about Wolvic is that it is multi-platform. It's not focusing on just one device or two. Uh, we try to support as many as possible through the OpenXR uh, abstraction layer, obviously, but there's still quite a lot of the device-specific work we, you need to do. You have to do some things are related to the OpenXR driver of each platform doing not exactly the same thing than the others. So we need to do workarounds or, or some fixes. And then the, the form factor, right? The, the size, the resolution, the size of the screen, the the field of view, um, the way you interact, the way hand tracking works. There are quite a lot of subtle differences that you need to adjust if you want the browser to run properly and as a native browser in each of the devices. Right? So currently, we officially support the Oculus Quest uh, 2 and 3, the latest Pico devices, and the Huawei VR glasses. And we are about to release the, the packages for Le the Lenovo 3 and, and the Lynx R1. Uh, we are also working on other things, but they are still not uh, public yet. Uh, but soon we will have a few more devices. Uh, a, an area where we are quite active is uh, UI, uh, um, the UI metaphor. We originally, uh, as you saw in the videos, the browser was, and is still a bit kind of traditional in the sense that you see a 2D browser with menus. And we are going to try to progressively remove these limitations and, and moving from, for example, just three windows, same size, to a very flexible uh, way of organizing windows of different sizes. You can have also more. Um, we are going to allow a very soon uh, configuring the distance uh, between the window and the user, which is something that uh, many users are requesting as, a, as an interesting feature. And we are also playing with a more uh, 360 oriented ways of uh, presenting the information. So the bookmarks wouldn't maybe don't need to be a menu hidden somewhere. They can be around you. You can take, the, take them and maybe throw them to the tab and open them, this kind of things, right? The, because we control the 360 environment, we, I think we can be quite ambitious about how we are going to do these this UI metaphors. And uh, finally, we, we are fully open source. We are developed in the open. Uh, we, we, we keep the Mozilla license from the uh, initial times of the project. Everything happens in GitHub. 
and the project is collectively funded by a group of, of companies, most of them uh, device manufacturers, but also other kinds of companies. And, and also there's an open collective associated to Wolvic, which is a platform where you can, even as an individual or a small company, you can contribute and, and you get some participation in the project uh, through participating in the roadmap definition or, or these kind of things. We are distributing the project in, in three app stores and more are coming. Uh, and there's a public roadmap where you can find basically a lot of the things that I mentioned uh, today. Um, so that's it. As, a, as conclusions, uh, we really think that web browsing is, is a key uh, uh, use case in general for, for XR uh, that enriches what users can do with, with a device uh, from day one because you get benefits from what the web uh, offers, which is a lot. And there are specific use cases like education, productivity, um, uh, or uh, video playing in general, or gaming, which are what we see are getting more traction. And the web lowers, as, as I said earlier, the uh, path to experimenting and distributing and can be a very interesting field for innovation. Together with native platforms, uh, we think WebXR and, and 360 videos uh, have a lot of potential. And we see Wolvic as a project that can uh, be uh, part of the commons, part of the open web, uh, fully open source, fully, uh, we really welcome people to, to contribute on, on any way as users reporting or as, as developers. And uh, yeah, we want to make it a really uh, 360 oriented browser uh, that is uh, thinking fully uh, in how to enrich this kind of device. So this is it. Uh, thanks a lot for, for your attention. And I don't know if we have some time for questions. Thank you very much, Juan. Please give him a round of applause. <clears throat> uh, we still have time for one or two questions. Is there anyone who would like to ask Juan about his insights that he gave today? Please raise your hand. And I come with a microphone. Please. Please say your name. and. Thank you. Hello. Uh, my question is that in your list of supported devices and platforms, I see that you have all kinds of Android-based devices. Uh, do you plan or not plan to support Microsoft HoloLens? OK. So that's a good question, because we have been thinking about that uh, quite a lot. As I said, when I explained the architecture, there's a part of the browser that is quite uh, Android-specific, which is basically the UI, the high-level part of the UI. Not all of it, because the library is portable, the 3D library, but the widgets, basically. So it is a bit of work to port it to non-Android platforms, but it can be done. And we have it as a, as a future idea. We, we will probably eventually do it, but not in the short term. Probably at some point next year, maybe we will try to, to support some other platforms. Time for another very quick question, maybe. Yes. Yeah, yeah, because you, you mentioned the 360 video, do you also uh, support spatial audio with them? Yes, uh, in, in, the, in Gecko, we, we depend a bit for, for, multi, for multimedia support, we depend a bit, a bit on the web engine. So in Gecko, there's a bit of support for that. Uh, we even contributed some fixes upstream to Gecko to make sure that it worked, but it doesn't work uh, like uh, fully. Uh, it works in some cases, depending on how you do a spatial audio. And then with Chromium, we will have full support for that. So I think uh, with that version, it should be working perfectly, yes. Uh, starting in November, as I said. Thank you very much, Juan. Thank you for this presentation. And please give him another round of applause. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you.